this assembly. Privilege, privilege to have this group of men here. Uh, some of you brethren, we've got places up here for you. Uh, Brother Keno, we've got a place for you. Uh, I try to feel all we can. Brother, and see a brother out there that's close to you, just motion him up, sit beside you there. And um, these are tremendous days that we're living in, seeing the condition of the world and uh, realizing our need for help. I think every one of us would agree that we need help, wouldn't we? Amen? <laughs> we need help from God to help us. We don't know altogether what that early church looked like. We get hints, we got the Bible to get some inclination of what it was like. We want to build exactly the way that early church built because this is a, the rest of the early church, if I could say it that way. This is the rest of the early church that we're trying to help Christ reap. And uh, I do want to make a few comments maybe tomorrow morning, but... Uh, Want to know? Want you to know how valuable you are. And if this is what we say it is, this is a hope of the world. This is what God's working on to help save everybody He can save out of this world. So I want to say welcome. I, we've got bathrooms on this side that used to be the ladies but for during the meeting there's a bathroom right through that door there you can use there's also one go down the stairs go to the right another one there we've got I think two bathrooms two or three back in the hallways if you need them uh, got water if you need anything else let us know the ushers in the back brother Paul would you stand up there's Brother Paul. You see him and the usher staff. They've got tags on them. Uh, if you need anything. Uh, and uh, I appreciate these elders, what I consider elders here uh, with us today. We've got Brother Brown, Brother Daves, these other men here. Brother Brown will be 90 years old in April. <laughs> I'm not sure how old Brother Daves is. You, you're close, aren't you? <laughs> Brother Days says no comment. <laughs> 87. In July. Uh, <clears throat> thank God for these men. God has allowed them to stay with us uh, all these years. We, we've reaped many things from the men that were before us. And uh, we didn't get all this on our own. Men planted things in our heart, and uh, we don't want to lose that, but we still want to keep reaching for the rest that God has. Uh, Brother Dave's message, we're missing something. I'll agree. Would everybody admit that in your own life? You're missing something? not saying the message is missing. I'm saying something in me is missing. I need to change. I need to make some improvements. So I'm going to open up here tonight. I'm going to have a couple of songs here <coughs> to help us out. But I uh, feel like this is a very important meeting. I'm looking forward and say, well, when, when is a meeting not important? I guess all of them are important, aren't they? But this is the time that we're working in right now. Um, 
I can dream of the future, and it's only a dream. I can look back at the past, and it's just history. But we're living in the now. Someone said the nasty now and now. We're living in that. What do we need today? Is Jesus still preaching? Is he still talking? Or is he went silent? Has heaven went silent on us? I don't think so. I think the Lord is still talking. I just want to get my ears tuned to what he's saying. And then if I do hear, when I hear, I want to be able to respond to what he wants done in their lives. So I might ask the Lord to help us pray here tonight. Ask the Lord to help us. And then we'll have a couple of songs and open it up here tonight. Could we all stand and just ask the Lord to cover us? Lord, we need you. Lord, this is your body. You have a place here that no one can feel. Come and take your place, Lord. Guide every word. Guide every action, Lord. Touch our minds. We're your servants. You're our master. We're asking help from you, Lord. You're the one that can truly help us. You're the one that can set us on the right path. You're the one that can change things in our lives. You're the one that can lift us, Lord. In this dark world, you can shine. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for all your benefits. Thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for these great men that you've allowed us to come together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Inspire our hearts, Lord. Thrill our soul with your presence, Lord. Be with us, Lord. We seek you, Lord. We desire your face. We desire your touch. Hallelujah. Your leadership, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Lord, purify my heart. Cleanse and wash the very inward part. Never let a single thing Hinder me from yielding everything. Let my spirit humbly be an example for the world to see. Let me dedicate my life an accepted sacrifice lord sanctify my life let me walk with you and do what's right let me always seek your will submit to you and hear your voice so still consecrate my all to you follow you and to your word be true apply the truth you've given me let me wholly follow thee Lord, purify my heart. Cleanse and wash the very inward part. Never let a single thing 
Hinder me from yielding everything. Let my spirit humble be. An example for the world to see. Let me dedicate my life an accepted sacrifice. Lord, purify my heart. Cleanse and wash the very inward part. Never let a single thing hinder me from yielding everything. Let my spirit humble be an example for the world to see. Let me dedicate my life an accepted sacrifice. Lord, purify my heart. Oh, cleanse and wash the very inward part. Never let a single thing Lord, hinder me from yielding everything. Oh, let my spirit humble be an example for the world to see. Let me dedicate my life an accepted sacrifice. Amen, amen, amen. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, on earth I long to be like Him all through life's journey from earth to glory I only ask to be like Him, to be like Jesus, oh, to be like Jesus, on earth I long to be like Him, all through life's journey. From earth to glory, I only ask to be like Him, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, on earth I long. To be like Him all through life's journey from earth to glory I only ask to be like Him to be like Jesus to be like Jesus on earth I long to be like Him all through life's journey from earth 
it to glory I only ask to be like him to be like Jesus oh to be like Jesus on earth I long to be like him all through life's journey from earth to glory I only ask to be like him That on now? Yeah. Several brethren are called in that not able to make it. Brother Benfield, uh, Brother Roger Bouvier, Brother Ensel Edmonds, Chris Arbano, Devon Nelson, and then the nation of Haiti. Uh, it's getting worse. I just alluded, told me a while ago they taken over the airport. People can't get in and out. The, it's getting bad, but but God, but God. So wanted to mention that, and also wanted to mention tomorrow morning, bring your wives with you, let them eat breakfast, and then they're going to have a, a something for the ladies uh, Wednesday and Thursday. So make sure and bring your wives with you, uh, and let them eat breakfast, and then they'll take them where they need to go from there. Service starts at uh, 7 o'clock at night, breakfast in the morning, 8.30 to 10. Service starts at 10.30 in the morning, dinner at 3. So I wanted to get all that done. And if you go out the hallway and need to know where to go, just look up. There's placards show you where to go, first aid, restrooms, dining room, dining room. You can find that at the end of the hall. All right, brother, and it's open, whatever you feel to put on the floor. Certainly would like to leave room for these elderly brethren. And I told Brother Brown, he said he was he's old. I said, well, you're just getting older. He's been old for a long time, he told me. <laughs> Yeah. We're missing a briefcase. Brother Jackson. Where, what's it look like? Tan leather. So if everybody could just look at their seat and see if there's a tan leather. Got a lot of gold in it. Tan leather? Tan leather uh, briefcase. Brother, it's yours, Brother Jackson? Yeah, Brother Young had it. Brother Young got Brother Jackson's briefcase somewhere? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. He said it's full of gold. <laughs> All right. Just look around you if you see it. Make sure Brother Jackson gets it, if you don't mind. All right. It's open, brother.
I'm a little bit reluctant to say anything because I don't know what Brother Bragg's feeling for the meeting, and I don't want to get us off track or anything. So, but he did say that we need we want to build just like the New Testament ministry built. And uh, I might put some of this out as a question, somewhat anyway. And that is concerning the fivefold ministry. Apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists. Do we believe that the early church uh, was primarily under an apostolic ministry of those 12 men and Paul? And then I guess a question would be is, do you know what your gift is? If you know what it is, do you know the function of it? Do you know how that gift works? Do you know how to operate within the boundaries of the gift that you have? Uh, Paul did say, firstly, apostles, secondarily, prophets, and thirdly, teachers. <coughs> uh, of course, I know helps were involved there. In fact, if you look at the hand, you know, there's, there's a thumb and four fingers on there, but there's a big palm there. That's part of the ministry. That's part of your support. Part of your laborers, workers, helps, and governments that's holding you up. So, uh, you know, uh, I have that, I've had that in my mind for a long time, is how the New Testament operated under those apostles. Are we, are we going to restore, will that be in the restored church? I, I'm not saying we don't have apostles today, but I, I don't believe we have apostles on the exact same level as the early church yet. I think we're right that we're I think Brother Day is right. I think we're missing some things that still has yet to be established among us. Uh, I remember uh, back in the late seventies when I don't know how many of you were here back then, I'm sure many of you were and you probably remember the phase we went through on ap apostles, it, it brought a lot of damage. It doesn't mean that it wasn't, a, there wasn't any truth to it. We just weren't ready to handle it. We seemed like everybody, <laughs> you know, well, I don't guess everybody wanted to be an apostle, but I'm not sure everybody understood the responsibility and the load of it or even the gift of it or how it operated. I, I have a feeling that just like when you were born naturally, you were born with gifts and talents. And I think when you were born spiritually, you were born, if you, if you had a gift in the ministry, I think you you know, we all have the saying, I remember when God called me to preach, but what we may remember is when he revealed to us what our calling was, or what, or what, we're, what our gift was, if we had a gift in the ministry. But we're all, every, including every saint, is a member in particular of this. And uh, we can't be something that we're not. We can only be what we are, and I think our gifts will manifest what we are in time. Uh, and then I've got this question. Do men have more, can, can a man just have one gift, or can he have more than one? I think some have more than one. I think there's certainly some that just have one. But I'll leave that as a question. Um, and this 
you know, since it's open tonight, Brother Bragg, I'm certainly subject to you. And, and so I'm not trying to put something out that we need to necessarily deal with in this meeting. It's just it's open tonight. I just thought I'd, uh, we have talked about building. And I, I could say something a little bit further. I, I have mentioned this before. I don't know how well it was accepted. But uh, let me mention a scripture in, in Revelations, the fifth chapter, and then maybe go back to uh, In the sixth verse, where it says, I and I beheld, John is talking here, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns. We know that horns, that prophecy, prophetically represents powers, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. <coughs> um, and, and, uh, I think it's in Zechariah, and I didn't, I mean, I, I certainly didn't come here with this on my mind, but just, uh, in Zechariah 4 and 10, it says, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of the Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. I'm given those scriptures because I, I feel like that the the seven spirits of God, I think that uh, I think that those gifts work through the Spirit of God. Uh, that's the source in my mind is how these gifts help the body, how they work, how they function. For example, the, the Spirit of the Lord is, I think that's reserved of God the Father. That's His Spirit. He manifests Himself through the Spirit, through His Spirit. In the Spirit of wisdom, Jesus is the wisdom of God to, to the world. And in the spirit of understanding to me is an apostle. He deals with those apostles back there, dealt with the big picture. They, uh, they, it looked like to me that that thumb, you know, is, represents the apostle, and those four fingers are extensions of his gift. I think he's got all of them. And back there, those early church apostles, but. Uh, when the administration of those works got so big, they needed help. They needed those gifts that worked in certain special areas. Uh, so the gift of understanding, I, I think the apostle gives the overall plan of God in the big picture. But men like teachers Prophets come in and fill in the gaps, fill in the details. Uh, uh, there's a scripture in, in uh, Proverbs. Let me try to think of where it's at. Maybe 24. Yeah. Proverbs 24, 3 says, Through wisdom is a house built. Christ, who is the builder of the house, 
and by understanding it's established. I think it was Paul and in uh, Romans, the first chapter, when he was writing to them and told them that he would like to come to them that whereby he might impart a, a, spirit, a gift whereby they might be established. His gift would establish a work. And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. I've <laughs> got a brother in my church. You know, when I talk on Babylon, I'm talking about what we're seeing out here is Babylon and different elements of in Christianity and organizations. And I paint that spiritual picture. And I asked him one time, he's, he's a good teacher. I said, I'd like to hear you talk on Babylon. One Sunday he got up told how thick the walls was in the city of Babylon, how big the city was, and how tall them walls were. And Lord, he, he went down a natural line painting a, a picture. It, it made a good picture. I'd, I'd never looked at it exactly that way, but he filled the chambers that more, more information that helped us get a bigger picture, even how to transfer it over spiritually. Then I think it says a wise man strong, a man of knowledge increases strength for by counsel. So, you know, I think the fear of the Lord is basically comes to us. They're sent forth into the earth. It comes to us through a prophet, a prophet. I think Brother Leninger was a good, uh, his main gift to this body was a prophet. And he'd get to talk and he'd draw up the future so close to you, you'd think. My Lord, I got to get straightened up and get ready for all this. Fear God and judgment. The prophet deals in judgment. He'll, he'll work on you. And keep talking about judgment, brings conviction on you. Teachers, of course, I mentioned the, the spirit of knowledge. I'm not. I'm saying. I'm not saying this is the only place it's housed. I'm saying that's where it's sent forth into the earth by ministry. And that that ministry is giving it, it they're, they're giving what their gift gives and it goes all the way into the saints. The saints wind up having wisdom and knowledge and counsel. And to me, that's what a pastor is. He can take an apostolic, apostle's doctrine, break it down to where he can counsel a saint in whatever they're going through with the word of God, the apostles' doctrine, and help them with whatever they have, whatever they entail in life. The word, they can break the word of God down. That they're counselors. That's what they are. Uh, an evangelist, to me, is it would have to be the spirit of might. If you eliminate the others, but if you look at them in the New Testament. You know, the Apostle Paul, when he started out, he started out with an evangelistic gift, doing miracles, healings. And that was God's drawing card. He called people to come and see, come and see the power of God, how it operates. But after he got, drew a crowd, wooed a woman with that gift, well, he had a, he had an, He became a pastor. He had to, he had to begin to deal with those people. Uh, after that, children of God was born. You know, if you can't live on bread, you can't live on love alone. You got to, Somebody's got to teach this. Somebody. He had to start teaching. They had, they had to start getting spiritual food. And, And then after those kids get, you know, when your natural kids get big enough, you start realizing that I've got to do something to get these kids ready for what they're going to meet out here in the world when they leave home. That's how a gift of a prophet works spiritually. You've got to prepare people for what they're going to face out here in their uh, adult spirituality, their adult life spiritually, how they're going to meet what the future holds. And uh, 
numbers. We don't have, it don't seem like we have too many men wants to be an, a, a, <laughs> an evangelist today or we don't see, you know, I know there's men got that gift. There's men that can do the work of an evangelist or have the gift of it and we need that. No question about it, but there's a, there's back in that early church, if you look at those men like, who was it that went to, uh, yeah, when he, where was it he went? My mind's not working too good yet, huh? Yeah, Samaria. Well, he, he did many miracles and healings when he went over there. Many people. I mean, even he even caught uh, Simon, wasn't it? The, you know, the, that uh, the sorcerer, yeah. But <coughs> God used him in a great way with the spirit of might. I'm I'm looking at it that way. I'm not I'm not a hundred percent. Well, you'd you'd have to work on me to take all this away from me. What I'm saying, because I've had it for a lot of years, but I just hadn't tried to. You know, it's not something I'm trying to promote. My main thrust is going back to. Do you know what your gift is? Do you know how to operate in it if you do? I remember Brother w Brother James Souders asking this question. Uh, you know, and, he, and, and he said that if you didn't know what your gift was, you better lay low. That's what he said. It. And, and when he said that, I was a young man. I thought, I, I better lay low. <laughs> But, you know, I do think, I think it's important to, to you know, I, we're a little reluctant to, you know, say what our gift is, uh, our gifts or whatever we have, we're, we're not wanting to promote ourselves, but at the same time, uh, you don't have to promote yourself to do the work and for others to be able to see what your gift is. But I think it's important for you to know your gift and how it works and how to work in that gift and what the function of that gift is. And I think it'd be wrong for us to think that we had all of them if we weren't, if we weren't an apostle or, uh, and then that is a dangerous, thing to try to promote. I don't think anybody ought to promote themselves. I don't think anybody necessarily ought to, uh, you know, promote others uh, outside of reason. But, uh, but anyway, I, I just thought I would, Brother Bragg, I thought I'd open that up anyway, just throw it out. We don't, we don't have to work on that, but thought I would mention it. Uh, you know, I've, I've searched my life. I've searched my, my gift. I know I've watched others. I've watched some of these elders. You know, they're careful about stating what their gift is. I've heard some of them say, well, if, if I'm this, well, then here's why. You know, but they were careful about how they put it out and, and those men came up back there in the 70s when we had that, you know, we had so many, so much, everybody was trying to get under an apostle. You, know, you got to be under one if you, well, I don't think you can get under anybody unless God puts you under them either. And then I don't think you can be a true apostle of God if if you are not willing to work and help people with no strings attached, just, um, you know, just being willing to work, being willing to help, being willing to support, be willing to build. I've, I've mentioned that, what I've went through, you know, when I was younger. You know, your saints come into this. When they first come in here, they think everything's lovely in your church. When they first get here, they think everybody's wonderful. 
but if they stay around long enough, they'll figure out it ain't all lovely. There's problems. There's as long as you got flesh, there's problems. You're gonna have to. If, so they'll figure out after a while where they're really at, what's really here. And uh, and the first thing you'll do if you're not careful is you'll become critical of the faults that you see. The same thing happens in the ministry when you get in the ministry. I mean, you young men, when you get here, you know, love this, but in a little while you'll find out it's we've got things we're working on. We're we've got issues. I appreciated Brother Wright mentioning being candid about us our problems in in Houston. I, I I think that was good. I think God gave us a great meeting in Houston to help us encourage us to work on work on what the things that need to be worked on and 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 encourage us that he's here to help us I, I believe you know I'm I, I want all of y'all know I'm a supporter of brother Wright I am I want to. I want to see him. Do, I want to see him make it. I want to see him be a great man of God. And I. I don't just mean that for Brother Wright. I mean that for every one of us. I want every one of us to be successful in God. I want to be a support to, to any everybody I can be a support of to try to build. Because I'm one of those young guys that you know when I saw problems I got critical and God had to deal with me and. I had to realize that, you know, what God told me was, he said, anybody can tear down. Anybody can look at the problems. But it takes wisdom to, to, to build, you know. And if you, what he told me was, is he said, you, you, you've never walked in the shoes of those men you're criticizing. He said, why don't you roll up your sleeves and go to work and build on what they're doing and because they're the best they got. And, and you, you can build, find what you can build on and leave the rest of it alone. Because here's what he told me. He said, because you don't have a voice right now. <laughs> I didn't like that part, but he was telling the truth. But he said, if you ever do get to a place you have a voice, you'll be able to build with it. You'll have to be able to use it to influence and build the kingdom of God, not tear it down. That day, Jesus changed my whole life. And I'm interested in this ministry. Thank God for you, brother. Thank God for a ministry like this. And I was just thinking the other day, if something happened to me and my case come up, I, right, this ministry is right here is who, who I would want to deal with me. I've got confidence in this ministry. I don't trust them as much as I trust Jesus, but I trust them more than anybody else I know of in this world. And so I want to see this ministry, just like Brother Greg said, I want to see it build just like that early church builds. I want God to help us. I've been really looking. I've been really looking at, at you know some things of uh, the. I'll just. I'm not going to go into the four carpenters, but they are what is that we're part of that that is building what has been tore down. And I've been looking at that those four angels in the river Euphrates that were loosed at and that, especially that month and that hour, that last 30 years and 15 years, if that's what it represents for sure, these last 45 years, we're in, to me, we're in a critical, critical place. I'm not afraid of it because I know Jesus is in charge. I'm not afraid of this election coming up. He's going to put in whoever he decides to put in. It might not be good. It might not be good. It, I mean, the people might not, not like the way it turns out. But, but, but it's going to be God's will. See, God does have judgment. 
He's put in a lot of wicked kings and dealt with people's sins. This nation is going to have to be dealt with by God before this is over with. So, but, but look, we're in a safe place. Just stay in the boat. Stay in that cave that Elijah was in when all that was going on on that mountain didn't entail him. Stay in the boat. We're on, we're, we know how this thing's going to come out and if you'll stay in, stay in this body, hold on to God, I believe with all my heart he's going to see us through and get us this finished work that the Bible uh, promises us. Anyway, I just thought I'd say those few things. Um, how can we tell uh, that we don't have a restored ministry? What, what are the purpose of having a restored ministry? When do you think that will happen, having a restored ministry? And... Um, and then how will we know when we have a restored ministry? If, if you don't mind, just clarification Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I think your first question was, how do we know if we've got a restored ministry or restored church? I think we've got the Bible to look at the New Testament and compare what, if we're accomplishing what they accomplished. Uh, the, one of the things is those men... Those men saw eye to eye. They were in unity. I will say this about that. I don't think that everybody in the New Testament church, you know, there was flesh there. I'm sure there was other ideologies that wasn't strong enough to have an influence over those apostles' doctrine and their, their, their gifts were so powerful that you just couldn't arise against it, looks like to me. I think that you know, uh, I think the fact that we're still struggling uh, in trying to come together more, and we've got different mindsets of where we came from and how God has put us together and what it's going to take for us to. Uh, and it looks to me like the only way we're going to move forward is God's going to force it on us. I'm not sure we can just figure it out. I don't, I've, I've gave up on that. <laughs> I feel like God's, it, you know, that's, that's the way most of us change is it's forced on us. And it's just a measure of growth. Uh, you may have to help me with another question or two you had there. It just... The purpose. I think the purpose would be, like for an example, in 
in Revelation 14, the 14th verse, where John saw one likened to the Son of Man sitting on a cloud. That cloud would have to represent a restored church. And a, a voice came out of the temple and said, he had a, th he had a sickle in his hand said, thrust in your sickle, for the earth is ripe and ready to harvest. So the purpose of a restored church is to do what the early church did. They harvested the, the end of the Jewish world. We're, we're going to have to have a ministry to harvest the end of the Gentile world. That's what this ministry is doing. We're, we're, we're coming together to get... God, God to get us in a position that we we can gather all of God's people out of Babylon that can be gathered out of there. That's part of the harvest. And not only out of Babylon, but out of the world. We're, we're, we're not having the power of God that the New Testament church had that we're able to accomplish what they were accomplishing. Look how God used them in that harvest as far as miracles, healings, great operation, power of God. I'm not saying we don't have any of that. I think we do in a measure, but we don't have it in a measure that is harvesting this world yet. That plus judgment. Judgment first must begin at the house of God. God's get, He's getting us cleaned up. He's getting our attitude, our spirits right towards one another and, and even ourselves as far as that's concerned. So God's done. I don't think, I'm, I'm not sure we're, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily that we're behind time. Or we may be doing the best we can do. Jesus is able to, he's able to change things with one flip of the switch. <laughs> So I, I've got confidence that he's he's in charge and he knows where he's going to take us and what's going to equip us to do the work that is ahead out here. That's what we're, that's what we're working on is getting the, the development and the equipment to do the job that God's got for us to do in the end of this world. I'm afraid of... I, I've got a timeline that I look at, but there's been so much put forth on a timeline that's been missed that I'm afraid to put anything solid on that till God gives us something more, you know, even Jesus, he wasn't, those disciples didn't really know exactly when what he was telling them was going to come to place, come to into operation until it took place. And even after he died and resurrected, he had to go back for 40 days and work with them and get them ready for the day of Pentecost for the harvest and the job that laid ahead for them. They still didn't understand it all, but it was forced on them. They had enough of, they had enough of what he gave them that they couldn't leave it, but they didn't really know what to do until it, things happened that caused them to have to do it. And I think it'll be somewhat like that for us, I think. I don't know that we can, we don't necessarily know what tomorrow holds. We, we, know, we know that we're close to the end of the Gentile world. We know that. We know we're living in end times. But as far as putting an absolute timetable on it, I'm afraid of projecting that myself. Anyway, I, I hope that's the best I can do, I guess. The, in the sixth chapter of the book of Acts, Peter made a statement about to pick out seven men full of the Holy Ghost, you know, good for poor. For he said, why should we wait upon tables, but let us give ourselves 
in the Word of God. Is it possible that that could have been the first laying on the hands of the of the pastors? Uh, I know that maybe if we forget, I don't know if Brother Green is here, but I learn a lot from him. To be a pastor, uh, to whittle out a work in an area, it takes youth, it takes strength, and you have to deal with all manner of people. If our elders are working in the pastoral ship, are they able to go on in the Word of God? Uh, a lot of us, or a lot of preachers have, you know, churches turned over to them. I believe that we're, we may be not using all the ingredients that's been given us. The ninth, uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, isn't it? Those nine gifts, it's easy for us to say maybe we have more than one gift. And it takes us away from seeking out the other gifts. The, I still believe that Ephesians 4 points out to us for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. I see that it could be a, a loophole that we're using. I'm an apostle and a pastor, which I think we're losing one of the most important ingredients of the ministry is our eldership. Well, uh, the elderships are like pillars, like this building right here that's holding up this ceiling. And I just wonder that if we would use like an Old Testament scripture, when she became to see Solomon, she made a point, this might be a type and shadow, but she made a point, how beautiful is thy table and the meat that's upon thy table. And those that sitting at the table and then those that are standing at the table waiting upon them. I just wonder if we hold out so much of the fivefold ministry, we forget about those nine gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. I believe that we could find those in the church that can do the work of miracles, diversity of tongues, gift of healings, and things of that nature. If we could find men that's willing to submit to that calling to support the ministry. I believe the nine gifts in the type and shadow was standing behind the fivefold ministry, waiting upon them to give them strength and help them with their ministry. So these three points that I just want to ask you or get maybe stir, stir our minds up a minute. Are we all apostles? No. Are we all teachers? No. Nor are we all a, a pastors either or an evangelist. And we've got, I just think that pastorship, you might jump on me for this, but I think pastorship needs to be focused on younger men especially those that go out in the ministry that has to work in the field to give their strength. The older you get, the less strength that you have. I know that may hurt some of the older pastors. I don't mean to. I'm trying to point out that Peter's calling was to point out those seven men. He's seen a necessity for the younger men to wait on tables, pray for the widows, help the sick, counsel with them as you said earlier so I'm, I'm wondering just throw this out for thought I'm wondering if we're bypassing the nine gifts and we're putting so much emphasis and what I see as a, as a, uh, a flaw maybe is we begin to say well I have this gift but I have three other ones with me and so what we do is we put more in one person than spreading it out We've got men in this building here that I've watched the gift of miracles work through them. I've watched evangelism work through them. I've seen them prophesy and it come to pass. And I, that's not in, that does not pastor a church. And I just wondered if we ought to encourage the nine and seek out the nine to support the five. 
that would be my question. Well, uh, I don't want all these questions just to be posed to me, but uh, one of the things that I'm, I, I think one of the things we do is we look at the New Testament, which was a divine order of God that operated directly under Christ and, and his apostles. And we haven't got that reestablished yet for us to operate in the same function or same way that they did. We're doing, I think, the best, like you said, you've seen men operate in all these different ways. I think men have burdens to work in certain areas, and that's what they do. And their, their, their gift and whatever measure that they have you know, Jesus was, I think it's in the third chapter of St. John, where he was given the spirit without measure. He, he, he wasn't lacking any of the seven spirits of God or, or the operation of God. He had the full package, and it looked like that those men, after his departure, and he sent them... Even as my father has sent me, even so send I you. It looked like that those men were equipped. We're, we're coming in this back door, we've always said. And we're working on this, but some of the things that I think we may be making or that we are to, might are to consider is, is that some of the scriptures we use in the New Testament uh, was in a church that was in a divine order of God that we're trying to restore. And we can't necessarily use those scriptures and make them fit us until the church is restored. We're doing the best we can. We're, we're I think we're utilizing, uh, it looks like Jesus, our high priest, is is giving us light, you know. He's he's a mediator, and he's given us light from that from that holy place, spiritually speaking. I know it's a type, but uh, it just doesn't look that like we've got the full operations, like Brother Bragg said. We're missing something. We all know that. There's we're not able to line ourselves up with that New Testament and say we're just like them. But we w that's our vision. And I'm not, I'm not sure that we can, you know, say, well, we've missed it by not doing this. I mean, we may, we may see some areas we, we look back and see maybe we need to work on. But uh, that's why I brought out the question, do you know what your gift is? Do you know how to operate in it? Do you know what its function is? And... Uh, we're, we're going to have to have elders like those early men that have no agenda. They're not, they're not trying to build a kingdom. They're not trying to do anything but build the kingdom of God. And they'll suffer for it. They'll, they'll give their life for it. We've got men. He said, some of these elders have done, they've gave their life for years. Some of them died at that. So... Is it possible that our elders are still waiting tables and not going on into the Word of God? Which means, is it possible that our elders, this is going to come out wrong, but it's just me. Is it possible that our elders are wasting time <laughs> waiting tables when they should turn their church over to a younger man and go on in the Word of God and help bring us up to date? It's possible. But most of them probably are, you have to come to the realization of that. You got to come to a development in your gift to 
know what you're supposed to be doing. Some of us spend a big, you know, I wish I wish I wasn't the age, I wish I was 40 years old know what I know today. <laughs> but it don't work that way. Uh, but hopefully we'll get, we'll get, we'll get this thing in a, a greater operation and it'll be operating a lot more fluidly uh, in the future. I, I've got hope for that. I believe Jesus is going to have a ministry and a church like that early church. I believe that. I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe that, but I believe that. Just, I think we just got to stay, stay the course. We're doing the best we can do. If any, I mean, you could ask you know, what Brother Watson used to say, all false prophets in here stand up. <laughs> you know, everybody, everybody thinks they're doing the best they know how to do or they'd change. So we're, we're still working on this. It's a big project. Good to be here. Thank you for inviting us, Brother Bragg. Uh, it's good to be among the brethren. Feels good to be together, doesn't it? <clears throat> Loving one another. I have to forgive my voice. I've had a, uh, this for about four months. <clears throat> I think it's reoccurring. Something else comes or something. But anyway, I think before we can. figure out by the grace of God uh, the operation of a ministry today that we would call a restored ministry I think we have to establish the limitations of that ministry compared to those apostles in the early church we are not going to be them we are not going to write the word of God um, we already have the truth. It's the Word of God. It's there. Brother Souders did not create any truth. Brother Souders discovered the truth that was already there in the Word of God, by which all of us have access to that truth. We are all preaching at least part of the apostles' doctrine. We don't need an apostle for us to preach the apostles' doctrine because we already have apostles. They were ordained by Jesus Christ and they were given to the church. And they established that church and the foundation of that church and the scriptures that we are all to learn how to live by. So I think before we can really get a really good grasp of what that's going to look like or what that is, we have to understand there's certain limitations that we are going to have compared to those men. Not that those men are better, brother. Sharber might be more spiritual than some of those men. He might even have more knowledge than some of those men when it comes to all the different aspects of history, the Jewish history, the New Testament church history, the falling away. None of them were there when the falling away took place, nor do they understand stood the history of that. You have that in you. You have knowledge that those men did not have. You have experiences today that they didn't have. But the common denominator is the Word of God. And I think it's very, very important to understand that is the final authority, is the Scriptures. I'm not the final authority. I never will be the final authority. Everything I preach, somebody gave to me. 
it would be very rare if any of us preached anything here that somebody didn't give to us. Everything the apostles taught, somebody gave to them. It was given by the inspiration of the Almighty. None of them wrote the words that they wrote that we call the scriptures today by their own ability or their own intellect or their own reasoning. They wrote that by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and it became the word of God. I do not foresee, and you know, I suppose it could happen. I guess nothing's impossible with God, but I don't foresee anyone coming upon the scene that's going to write new scriptures. Uh, I just don't see that as anything in the scripture that would indicate that was going to happen. Uh, doesn't mean it would be impossible, but I don't see it myself personally. So I think establishing boundaries. Uh, when we start talking about apostles, I get a little afraid. I will admit because I've seen it abused. Uh, sometimes I think we put too much importance on us as individuals and our gifts. Um, something I re realized, I came to realize something, that God is no respecter of persons. I know that's not, it's probably not a revelation to you, but it was a revelation how it came about to my mind. And that is that no successful work is successful because of you. Works are successful because of biblical principles, the commandments of God, the spirit of God, the truths of the word of God, the nature of God, and anyone and everyone that puts those things into practice in their lives are going to receive the benefit of those things. It doesn't matter who they are, where they come from, what their IQ is, what their nationality is. None of that matters at all. What matters to God is his ways. Israel has known my works, but Moses knew my ways. It's his ways that he honors. It's his ways that he respects. It's his ways that he's going to lift up. It's his ways that he's going to inaugurate. And, you know, much to our surprise, he's doing that all over the world right now. Among people that don't even know us and have never even heard any of our teachings. And some of them already have our teachings. Because it's... He's, that's not what he's honoring. He's honoring. He, he honored Brother Sauters because Brother Sauters discovered the truths of the word of God that God had already honored. It was the honoring of his truth that lifted Brother Sauters up in the ministry and caused us to follow what God had given him and others to follow what God had given him. But it was, it was what... It was God's. It was God's. And so, <clears throat> I, I, I think this, brethren, that like Paul said in Corinth, he said, I'm, I'm worried, uh, thank you, I'm worried because I'm afraid that you will be, and I'm not saying this to you personally, I'm quoting Paul, I'm afraid that you will be beguiled after the simplicity that is in Christ as Eve was beguiled in the garden. Because the truth is, this is simpler than we're making it. It is the word of God that's going to get the results. It's not a, a man that gets lifted up or... Uh, you know, oh, he's got this great power in his life. Peter really contradicted that 
when he healed the man there at the gate and he said, well, what do you think? We're better than you or that we're greater than you because we were able to make this man walk? He said, it was not by my ability or my gift that this man walks, but it was by the name of Jesus Christ that this man stands before you. And I think for all of us, you know, I, I had to come to this real realization that uh, God honors his operation. The less people see of me, the less they recognize me, and the more they recognize Jesus Christ and his operation, the greater the work will be because no flesh is going to glory in his sight. And honestly, I foresee in the future a ministry that disappears, a ministry that has the mindset that I must decrease that he might increase, a ministry that has way more trust than we do today that uh, we would trust these other gifts to operate, uh, that the evangelist could freely work among us and win souls and bring people into your church and your church and your church and your church and, your church and, and come and labor with you for, if, if, if there's not an evangelist in your own assembly, he could come and labor with you for several months and you would love him and nurture him and care for him and he would bring in, now, now there's a lot of men that might think they're evangelists and they might want to come to your church and have you, you know, take care of them, but they wouldn't produce anything. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the real operation of the evangelist that when he throws the net out, now, mind you, when he throws the net out, you're not going to like everything that comes in. <laughs> As you said, Brother Smith, that would be the job of the pastor then to begin to separate what comes in that net, but to see that evangelist. You know, there was something... You may not like what I'm about ready to say, <clears throat> but there was, I got to thinking about the Haitian people and the work that Brother Nick built. And I asked myself, what differentiates between his work and other works that have been built? What, why has so many of the Haitian people come into the body of Jesus Christ? Why? What was the difference? And I'll tell you what the difference was. It might not be the only difference, but I will tell you this. Brother Nick Gruitt taught world evangelism. Brother Nick taught go ye into all the world. He taught go and win souls and gather as many. He went to Catholic churches. He'd lay hands on nuns and they'd receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And at that time, he got a lot of criticism for a lot of those things that he did because they were unorthodox. I think, I think Brother Patton was unorthodox. I think Brother Patton was willing to go do things that other people would have considered fairly un... He was always looking for the next move of God. He would go to the highways and byways and search to see if God was doing something somewhere that we didn't know about because he wanted to know if that was what was taking place. And, and, what a, and, and look what happened because of that. Look what happened through his work and his ministry because of the openness that he had to want to find everything God was doing and he did not care where it was or who it was that was going to be doing it. And that spirit produced something. And Brother Nick's spirit produced something something you know when I was laying a foundation in Honduras I said your doctrine produces your spirit it produces your walk and it produces the kind of love you're going to have toward each other and it is true that we can limit ourselves based on what we teach or what we believe to be true or not true 
And my fear is, as we look at this, you know, and, and I, I believe, Brother uh, Smith, that, that this is the mind of the Lord. I, I do believe that we are going to have to figure out the operation of the ministry because there's going to be a world ministry. It's not going to be an American ministry. 30 years from now, you're going to be shocked at men that might be sitting at this table and from what country they're from and, and what nationality they are and how God uses them in a mighty way. If we're going to be the, the, the restored church, the world body, there's many, many, many things that are going to change. And our paradigm is going to get changed. And it's, it's going to be uncomfortable. And maybe, maybe all of us, forgive me, I know some guys get upset with me for saying this, but maybe all of us older guys have to die off for that to happen. I'm including me and older guys. I'm 68, so I'm not a spring chicken. I don't feel like a spring chicken. <clears throat> Although, who it was it you that told me that story? That was a really good story you told me today about that 95-year-old woman that Brother Sharver told the story of a 95-year-old woman. Was she 95? And he said, what one thing? <laughs> if, you could, if you could ask God for anything, what one thing would you ask God for? It was funny. And she said, oh, to be 70 again. <laughs> Everything in perspective, right? <laughs> so as we, as we contemplate, I think, I think there are some changes in our minds that is going to have to take place and I think we have to look through a historical lens uh, in order to really be able to see some of those things because, uh, as I said, there's some uniqueness about that early church that you and I are not going to do. We're just not, we're, we're not going to write the word of God. And when I speak with authority, I don't speak with authority because I just pinned something that became the living word of God. I speak with authority because I just read something that is the word of God. And I speak by that authority and not my own authority. So there's going to be some differences. There's going to be differences in, in the uh, reality of allowing men you know, I hate to say this, but we can't wait till everybody's 65 or 75 or 85 years old uh, for them to get the amount of honor and openness to operate in their gifts if we want to see the gifts really work. There is a difference between an elder and a gift. An elder is somebody with years and years and years of experience that you can draw from. Not that they don't have a gift, but they might. Brother Sharper's gift and Brother Dave's gift it might be completely different gifts, but they both may be elders because of their experiences in their walk with God. But God may raise up some gifts among us that might shock us who he uses, and how he uses them. As a matter of fact, we might actually hear ourselves say these words. That is the last person <laughs> that I would ever think that God was going to use that way. <clears throat> because God does things. I mean, who would have expected God to take Rahab? Who would have expected the Moabite woman to be in the seed line of Jesus Christ. Who would have picked that? I, I'm sure we would have all penciled that one in, wouldn't we? We wouldn't have penciled it in because it was unorthodox. It wasn't the prescribed way. It wasn't what we were, it wasn't what we were going to expect. But God does the unexpected. And I dare say, and I think, Brother Smith, in order for us to become or to learn or see or grasp what the future is going to hold, I think all of us are going to have to be willing to accept the unexpected. The, the unexpected. That God's going to have the liberty to do things that doesn't fit our paradigm. It doesn't fit our mold. It doesn't fit the way we are thinking. And that is so hard to do. And, and as we age, 
I'm talking about me. You crystallize your thinking. You, you get in a position of thinking in certain realms, certain operations. If you notice, Brother Jackson, you're getting old enough for this experience to happen to you that you'll decide you're gonna make some changes and you're gonna do some things differently and you look back 30 days later and you're doing it exactly the way you did 30 days before. Because the things that you've deeply woven into your mind and into your habits and into your emotions keep coming back over and over again and you find yourself doing the exact same thing again 30 days later. And the older you get, the, the stronger that becomes because it just becomes a deep rooted pattern inside the mind. Uh, so when we look at uh, the apostle, I think we really do need to discuss the differences between those 12 apostles and, and, and an apostle today, if there are apostles today. And I'm not saying there is not apostles today. I'm just presenting that question out there. Uh, the pastor, uh, the evangelist. What, what is the parameters of an evangelist? Could we, could we, through Brother Moore, the scriptures, define a truly biblical evangelist? What about the prophet? It's pretty interesting, but if you think about this, because the foundation was laid upon uh, the apostles, the prophets, and Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Yet, when you study the New Testament scriptures, how many prophets do you hear speak? How many, how many events do you, would you say, oh, that, that, that's, that's a prophet working right there. That, that's a prophet gift working right there. Yet, the church's foundation is laid on the prophets. Now, me personally, I put those prophets back in the Old Testament that those are Old Testament prophets that he's discussing, not the actual gift of the fivefold ministry prophet that we see operating in the New Testament. But that, I think we need to discuss that. I'd like to hear, as you said, you know, before we can know, we have to clearly define. Because if, if, if you have an image, and, and Brother Sharber, you have an image, and I have an image, and Brother Driver, you have an image, and we all have these different concepts and different images of a fivefold ministry. I don't see how in the world we're going to be able to see that fivefold ministry working in its proper form. So I think a lot of discussion needs to take place on defining those operations and defining uh, the differences between those men that uh, God ordained to write the Holy Scriptures and us today or maybe those in the future could be, right? I mean, Brother Bag, it could be men in the future that we're talking about right now. But just what are those operations? How would, and, and, and how badly do we need an evangelist? I think personally that we need an evangelist, evangelist very badly in the body of Christ. Me personally, and I know I'm going to be a little offensive with this statement. I believe our doctrine has hindered, hindered our growth. Because we believe this wasn't going to go to the, all the world, was, which, by the way, was not very logical when we went to all the world in the United States, whether it's Texas or Florida or wherever, because we basically held that concept for many years, we... we Kind of with, we, we, and, and I'm going to give you an example of, of that. How many know how many Mormons there are in the world today? Anybody have an idea? It's about 7 million. Now, how many know how strange the Mormon doctrine is and strange the Mormon religion is? How many of you know that most of the religious world think they're really wacko? Right? I mean, that's true. Okay, if that be true, then we couldn't say, well, it's because our doctrine's hard, or it's because we, our standards are so high, or it's because of this or that. That's why we're such a small group. 
No, the Mormons should be smaller than us based on their just strangeness that they have, their doctrines that they have. But why do they have seven million? See, that's what the question has to be asked. And I'll tell you why. Because they send out two young men, two by twos, all over the world, and they have done this for I don't know how many years, how many decades. I see them all the time in Honduras, and I talk to them all the time. I ask them how they're doing and how, you know, how successful have they been and, and how has God helped them. And, and I asked a couple boys the other day, I said, so, so let me ask you a question. What happens when you're done? He said, well, I'll go home. I'll go to the university, their university, and I'll get a degree, and I'll get a career, and I'll marry, and I'll have a lot of children, and I'll teach my children what I've learned, and I'll send my boys out on the mission field, and they'll go two by two to other parts of the world. He said, that's exactly what we're going to do. Sometimes it's our behavior that gets our results, and maybe all the time our behavior gets our results. So I believe there has to be a paradigm shift. Whether, and I don't care whether it's your, the, 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 the city next to you. I don't care where it is. Think about how many cities in America we've not even begun to touch. I mean, I think about uh, Roanoke and how many of the 200,000 people have we ever reached it's minuscule. So as part of this restoration of a five-fold ministry, there has to become a restoration of the operation of, those, of that ministry. But how does that happen? It, first, we've got to change how we, how we see things. Secondly, I think we have to give room for evangelists to work. Man, I'd, you know, there, there was a brother among us uh, that... I remember it in the 70s, early 80s. He worked among us, and I'm telling you, this body loved his gift. He's in Florida. And when he preached, things shook. And the, this brotherhood loved that operation. Is that true or not true? I mean, they... they kind of thrived on that and and i will be honest with you as a young 25 year old preacher i thought this seems like showmanship to me this i don't know i just don't feel that comfortable with it that was my uh feeling about it but i will say this that somehow evangelists are going to have to go out and win your neighbor and win over the next city and when, I mean, those are some of the things that we have to, I believe, Brother Smith, define. And what is that going to look like? What is that going to look like? And why can't it be happening right now? Are we, are we limiting what we could be doing by the way we think? See, that's, that plagues me. That really does plague me. I'm afraid of that. There's not very many things that I'm afraid of. If you ever drive with me in Honduras, you'll believe that when we get done because you will be very afraid. <clears throat> and I will have a big smile on my face. But I am very afraid of how I think. And I'm very afraid of how I, the way I think, how, how much am I hindering God? And somebody says, well, you can't hinder God. But let me give you an example. When Jesus went among his own people, the scripture said he did not many miracles, only laid hands on a few sick folk because a prophet is without honor in his own house. The mindset of the people that knew Jesus personally in his own city that watched him grow up as a little boy was not open enough to let God work. If that's true, Brother Wright, with those people, does that also fit us? Can that be a part of our limitations, how we think? And so I, oh, I 
look forward to this discussion because I believe that there is some things we need to define. And then I also believe there is going to be a mind change of how we let, we discussed this in um, Fort Lauderdale and a bunch of young preachers came up to me, a bunch of them brother, and said, we're chomping at the bits. We wanna do something, but we don't feel liberty to be able to do something. And I said, well, you need to go home and sit down with your pastor and tell him you want to lift his hands up. And then you need to be ready for him to tell you the truth about yourself. Because there may be something in you that your pastor sees that he don't quite trust yet. So if you really do want God to use you, and if you're chomping at the bits to be used by God to go out and evangelize and gather, you need to have a sit down with your pastor because I promise you, I, I would say 99 out of 100 pastors, if, if you have some young men come to you and say, I want to go win some souls, you'll say, well, what, what have you been waiting on? Because I sure am hoping that you'll go win souls. So there is a growing consensus in the ministry, young ministers, that they want to do more, but they don't feel like they have the liberty to do it. That's something we have to deal with. That's... Um, you know, how did Philip, this guy that waited on tables, how did he wind up going to Samaria and doing all of what he did? You know, we've got, evan we've got men today, if they're an evangelist, can they get permission? See, they're under their pastor. Can they get permission to go out? If they feel to go to Samaria or somewhere that their pastor, it don't ring a bell to him, but they got a feeling for it. That's one of the things you mentioned about Clyde Patton. When a man would go to Clyde Patton about a feeling, he'd let him go. He'd let him go. That's why he had more ministers under him than anybody did because he would test them out and see what they could do. If God was with them, he'd get behind it. <clears throat> that it takes wisdom. I do believe that the young men should sit down with their pastors. I think, I think in order, you know, because they ask what, what it's going to take for a fivefold ministry to be restored. In order for a fivefold ministry to be restored, I believe all of us are going to have to get our thinking right about that. Because if God does raise up young men in your assembly, that feel called to do something for God, you you're gonna have to you're gonna have to get in the throne room of God and talk about this and say, okay, God, I don't want to hinder these young men because first of all, all of us are gonna have to admit that the gifts and callings come from God and not from men. I haven't call, I didn't call Brother Puckett to be a uh, a pastor or a preacher or a teacher. I didn't call him. He's not called by me. He had the gift of God in him and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and told me that he was the one to take my place. But I didn't give him his gift. God gave him his gift. We don't give gifts to men. The, Holy, the Lord Jesus Christ gives gifts to men. And quite frankly, I think it's fearful. If, and you have to forgive me because I grew up in, with a pastor that did give me great liberty and allowed me to do work for him. But I think it's fearful if I have young men that are feeling something from God, I would be very afraid not to let them do something because it, the, it's the perfect scenario. You brethren with wisdom and knowledge and experience and age and a loss of energy and a loss of drive to have a group of young men that want to go out and do that work and you be their overseer and you help them grow up like you did with Brother Bear. I mean, what a gift that Brother Bear has, you know. <laughs> It, the, the young people in Roanoke, I mean, he's like a guru to them. I mean, it was really funny to watch because, you know, they were very excited with his, his gift. In, 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 and he's a young man. I mean, he's not like 40, but he's a young man. And you let that gift grow. And that, if, if we want to see more, if we want to see a ministry restored, there's going to have to be a changing in our thinking 
and a liberalizing, forgive me for using that word, I know that's not a very good Republican word, a liberalizing of uh, how we perceive or allow the ministry to work. Because if, if we're going to restore that ministry, I, here's something, Brother Smith, I think is unique. This is why I admire the Apostle Paul so much. I mean, he was, I, I won't use that term. If, if it was, I was talking to a bunch of young people, I would use the term. He was the big dog. He was the apostle among the Gentiles. Yet, he had young Timothy go ordain i mean this should have been the apostle's job right i'm gonna go ordain the elders after all i'm the apostle i'm gonna lay my powerful hands on them and they're gonna receive from the lord the gifts and operations of god what does paul do he says go ordain elders in every church and don't let them despise your youth but go work son <laughs> i just love that attitude because he had the same attitude. First of all, Brother Nick had that attitude. He really did have that. I mean, we went there as young men on the mission field, and Brother Nick, oh, he didn't say, now, what are you going to be preaching in our churches? Or, you know, uh, he, he said, go, Brother Finnegan, go. You know, he'd send us all out to different churches and, and, and let us preach and teach and it was such a joy to go because you had such openness to minister whatever was in your heart. I was mentioning to somebody uh, today that because we're having a meeting over there in, in April and I, I told him, if you want to come, I don't want you to come and give me a flowery sermon. I don't want you to come and say, what a work Brother Finnegan is building. I don't want you to say none of that stuff. What I want you to do is get to your feet and feed the flock of God because that's what they need. They need men of God getting a hold of God, delivering their soul to those people and feeding the flock of God. Because I tell you right now, for sure, I can't do it by myself. So I'm really desiring to see a true fivefold ministry operate. I, I'm still confused about the prophet, to be honest with you. The prophet has me a little confused. You might be able to help me with that one because, you know, I don't see that much happening in the New Testament. There was, a, you know, we know Paul got tied up with a belt and I can't even tell if that prophecy, you know, I mean, some of those, like he, it was, it was like he told Paul not to go, yet Paul believed that God wanted him to go. So that was kind of confusing. Uh, <laughs> right? I mean, it was a little confusing. So uh, I, I really welcome this. And I, I do think, though, that we, we are going to have to reexamine and really get a clear focus on the differences between that time and this time. And then what are some of the problems that are going to come up when we really let a fivefold ministry work? And what are some of the benefits that are going to come up when we really let a fivefold ministry work? I think, first of all, it's good to be here. I have a tremendous amount of respect for Brother Bragg and the ministry here. And just as I entered it, the blessing of walking around, hugging the brothers and the fellowship, I just love this brotherhood. And it's really a blessing to be here. Um, something the Lord has been dealing with me on. And Brother Finnegan, you, when you talked about the younger brothers and us recognizing those gifts and respecting those gifts. I was taught amongst the brethren here when I was born into this body 27 years ago. Uh, I think it's Titus 1 and 8 where it talked about the, being a lover of good men. If you're a lover of good men and you see those gifts operating and you have a love for the overall body of Christ and not just your local assembly, I think you can embrace that. And it's something the Lord's been dealing with me on is um, I don't love my local assembly any more than I love all of you and love the body of Christ. 
I have a vision of the overall body of Christ in a restored church. And I've, you know, the Lord has been dealing me with that, dealing with me on that for the past four years. And hence I started traveling and visiting more assemblies and trying to help more. Um, and I need help as well in my assembly for sure. Right. But one of the things just to consider and just a question, I think there was a lot of unity operating in that early rain church and the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Books titled The Acts of the Apostles, but all you know is really the Acts of the Holy Spirit. But you saw the unity right there in Acts 2 in the beginning. It says when Peter stood, the 11 stood with him. Um, they were all with one accord in one place and the blessing came in. I wonder if they had, and I'm not being critical here, this is God's people and I love this ministry, but it's just a question even when Brother Days put out a while back, is there something missing or something more we should be doing? I wonder if they had a greater love and a vision for the overall body of Christ than just a local assembly. Even when you read 1 Corinthians 12, if you don't get the spirit of that message with the gifts there, you, those gifts begin to operate, and without the right spirit, we can be envious of one another. And that's why he penned there at the end, at the end I think he says something about, let me show you a more excellent way or something like that, right, which is charity, right? And so if we're talking about a restored church, I think there is some possibly, I don't want, you know, we always talk about not punching beyond our pay grade, so I'm just putting this out here for consideration. I think there is some opportunity for all of us from a vision of the overall church that we need to love one another and love each other's works and work together and get a vision of being a blessing to the overall body of Christ and not just our local assembly. And I, I was reading there, and you all know this passage of scripture very well, when it says that Paul withstood Peter to his face. I think Paul had a, such a love and a concern for the overall body of Christ that if he did not address that, that could have had a negative influence on the overall body. I don't think that was just his concern for churches that he planted. And what else do you read on later? Peter took that with the right spirit. Later on, it was mentioned. And so I guess it's a question that you don't have to respond, but just a thought. Because I love this brotherhood. I mean, I love, uh, I know this is God's people, but is there opportunity for us to have um, not just our local assembly, but is there more we can do to be a blessing to one another? And then we have the right heart and the Lord will begin to actually, I believe that's what the restored church is. It's all of us operating and having a great understanding that it's a lot bigger than I'm building my portion of the wall in Minnesota. But I also want to make sure that I can be a tremendous blessing to my brother. And when I see certain gifts operating, I have to be a lover of good men. I have to encourage those gifts and also not be envious of one another. Is there any opportunity for us there, just as a thought? I'm really enjoying this tonight. Uh, Brother Finnegan and uh, his brother here just bringing up these thoughts here at last about a one body. We know there's not but one body. We understand there's not but one head of one body or many members and according to Paul used 1 Corinthians 12 there. Uh, the part I like is that a natural body has the same care one or another. And I've been here a long time. I, I got the Holy Ghost in Cape Girardeau, 1961. I was called to preach and uh, 1973, 
and started attending the meetings regularly in the late 70s and never been anywhere else but this group of people. And I do have questions. We all should have questions about it. From what I've discerned, and I've mentioned this before, that that scripture that the body is to have the same care one for another. And it seems to me, what I can see and understand, just me, is that one of the things we're lacking because it, it seems that it depends on who you are and who you associate or are attached to in the ministry is how much or how little help you would get. There's churches that's got a lot of gifts in them, and Brother Finnegan, they just stay there. And there's a lot of our small churches. Wherever we go, there's just small churches. I've seen this in Cape Girada. I've been there since 61. I've watched it through the years. There can be a four or five Baptist churches or different groups in one town. And uh, they all go to the same conventions. But some of them has got larger churches. And then there are smaller churches. And the smaller churches never grow. Because the larger churches have more music, they have more things for the young people, they have the money to uh, buy nice transportations, uh, to go in neighborhoods and pick up the people within two or three blocks of the small church. Uh, and the big churches just keep growing. And this and the small churches for sixty some years as I've been in Cape, they've never grown. Still and they you know. But the, that spirit can be in us. Our young people through the years they'll go to conventions and they'll see a church with a lot of young people. And God will begin to talk to them. <laughs> uh, they'll find mates. They'll find uh, in, in the youth meetings and things. And that's where they meet their spouses. But have we always had this right? Have you got a, you got, I'll just use this for an instant. You got a young woman in the church, young girl in the church. And she's really needed in that church. She helps with the music. And got, she's talented. But there's a young man in another church, way off somewhere. And they get married. Our teaching for us, I know, is that the girl is always her, has to go where the boy is. Is that right? Is that the way that God would look at it? Could it not be that the boy would move there and help that small work? And uh, another thing, years ago, I know a preacher come through, and he taught on having a pioneer spirit. Brother Fennecum's got that pioneer spirit to go and look and blaze new trails where others hadn't went. And instead of trying to become a part of something's already running, if God puts it in your heart to get out and work and do something different. Now, I know we've held things real tight through the years, and I've, I've been guilty of that. But if there's one body, one spirit, there's one head, 
as one member is honored, we're to all rejoice with it, along with one that's suffering. If God raises up one of these young men and honors one of these young men, us old preachers ought to rejoice over the fact that God would raise up a young man. We ought not try to kill him somehow and pull the props out from under him and make him fall, but we ought to honor him. And doing so, I think God would honor us. But I've really, I'd like to see the changes. I know we talk about changes. And uh, the Lord dealt with me for the last few years about when Jesus said, having eyes to see, we see not. Having ears to hear, we hear not. And you know what the scripture says. He that knoweth they do good and doth it not to his sin. Now, every one of us has a conscience. And if God deals with you about something is wrong, you don't have to wait till everybody in the church has dealt with with that. That's a personal contact you have with the Lord, and you owe it to change. Maybe no one else around you will change. But you owe it if the Lord deals with you. And somebody mentioned for church here tonight about what I had said a few years ago, two or three years ago, about God is going to expose secret sins among us. And the way that the Lord showed me this happens, God will deal with you personally. He won't expose you at first. We have scriptures for that. God will deal with us about things in our lives. And if we don't change, then God will pull the cover off. He said that's done in secret. I believe Jesus said that. She'll be shouted on the housetops. And we can either fall on the rock, which is Christ, and be broken, our spirits be broken, our wheels be broken, or else we can resist the things of God. And finally, the rock has to fall on us, and it destroys us. It's not God's will that any of us perish, but he sure does want us to change. I've challenged people. <laughs> I said, we talk about, there is some of us, we, you know, there's a diversity of whether you can or can't move out a live soul, and uh, that's among us today. And if you can't, what keeps you from it? If you can, what can you do? So blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that's what you have to deal with, is your heart, your mind, things that God. And uh, I believe that God can take any individual. This is my personal thoughts, my own, the way I think. God saved me from a lost condition. And I was nobody, still nobody. But God has brought me to this far and changed me to much as he has. I believe there's a scripture said, he that began a good work in me can complete it. I don't, I don't, I'm not up here teaching that uh, everybody's going to be saved. I don't think that everybody was saved during the dark ages. But I can never see where there was not someone all through the dark ages as God picked out and took through and purified them and went through the fire. We talk about the persecutions that we have to go through. Listen, you take somebody that's dying with a cancer. That cancer gets a hold of them. 
and there's nothing they can do. They're living, they're dying every day. It's come to a point, and you see them get down to nothing, skin and bones, and nothing. And they can leave this world. I had a man that he told me when he was dying, going through this terrible condition of cancer. He said, brother, I never knew that I could be that close to the Lord. And we was working with him as he was leaving this world. He lifted one arm up straight in the air and looked straight up and smiled real big and laid that arm down. Now for me, I tried to say that God didn't take him through. I, I had rather be burned at the stake because you wouldn't last very long. You, you'd die of smoke insulation. you then lay in bed and die with some kind of disease like a cancer or something like that. And we've seen all through the years that God can pick people out and take them through these things. And we talk about we have to wait to the persecutions among us. Can you find scripture for that? Down through the dark ages and millions of people was tortured. Read the Fox Book of Mortars. Read, uh, read those things that those people went through. And we talk about persecution today. You know, somebody hurts feelings. You've been persecuted. And uh, what, what do we have to do to be any closer to the Lord than, like Brother Finnecom said, we've always had the Word of God. Hebrews 3 talks about Jesus being our apostle. He is our apostle. And he, he can plant you. And Jesus said, every plant my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. And I feel that God can and does take us from being nothing, from being saved, being filled with the Holy Ghost. And we teach that the Holy Ghost is to lead us and guide us into all truth. It's to lead us and guide us in the truth about ourself. Let us see ourself. And Several years ago, I was diagnosed with going blind. I haven't yet, uh, several years ago. But God began to show me some things about being blind. I drove by his great big church one time, and, and I looked at the cars on the parking lot, and I said, Lord, I know them are your people, because I know some of them. But I don't understand why so many of them, so few of us. And a voice, not out of my head, but right out of my chest area, come up in my face and said, a blind man can feel me, but he can't see me. And I said, oh. And the scriptures, two of them immediately come to me. Without a vision, the people perish. For the lack of knowledge, they're destroyed. It takes the knowledge of God that 2 Peter 1, chapter 1, talked about for us to be saved. And then, just a few months ago, the Lord began to deal with me about a man can look in the mirror. A blind man can look in the mirror and not see himself. 
How many people remembers Brother Doc May? All of us here the last several years. Brother Doc May, he was standing looking in a mirror in our bathroom in Cape Girada. And, and I walked in there and I seen him. Brother May was combing his hair, looking in the mirror. And I thought, that man can see. It wasn't very long I stood there and watched him. He took two fingers and he would feel and comb. He was standing looking in the mirror and could not see himself. Now, we can do the same. We can stand and look in the mirror according to Scripture and not see ourselves. And the Bible says we need to examine ourselves, see whether we're in a faith or not. And you can walk away and forget what manner of man you are. You could be gone blind. And a blind man, I know, now this is no, I'm not throwing off anybody that's going blind or have gone blind, but I have to use uh, Brother Emmanuel Jones here, so he's he's taking care of, of Brother Jones. Brother D.L. Jones, you know, a few years ago, Brother D.L. Jones could look at a vehicle and know what it and describe it. But today, he can't look at a vehicle and describe. He can tell you what one looked like 15 years ago, but today he couldn't look at one. I'm talking about naturally now, not saying anything, because I believe he, he's a very spiritual-led man. But here's how to examine if we've gone blind or not. If all we can see is the good times we have had, if all we can see is the past of this body of people, all we can see is the great men of God, and we can't see nothing that God's doing today, it could be because we're losing our vision. So we, we need to see what God is doing today. He's not quit working. And I don't want to go blind spiritually. I want to have eyes to see and see. Blessed are your eyes, for they do see, your ears that they do hear. And I want to keep my ears and my eyes spiritually on the Lord and this movement and what God's doing. And I believe there's going to be some major changes in the near future, Brother Finnegan, of how God is going to take this body of people. God bless you. I've enjoyed this subject. I've got some new thoughts tonight. Brothers brethren, Brother Smith, thank you for introducing that. I was looking at Ephesians 4 again. Wherefore he said, and when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Then I just skipped down the 11th verse and gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Those gifts that you got is to deliver the nine gifts. Is that right? Does that make sense? We're just conduits. That's all we are is conduits to deliver what God's got for his church. God's making changes. Whether we realize it or not, it's already changing. Brethren are reaching out all over this world. Already. It's already happening. But uh, like the thought, we're not going to rewrite the doctrine. That's not going to happen. So those apostles have a place that the apostles of this day will never have. 
but the apostles of this day are to reiterate what those apostles established years ago. And what we're going to do is to write the acts of the apostles of this day. Is that all right? We're to act, perform what God's got for us, but that won't be different than what they delivered 2,000 years ago. I got some new thoughts tonight. I appreciate these thoughts of these brethren here at uh, the pipes, the conduits are not the most important thing. You go back to, where is that, Zechariah 4, isn't it? About the olive trees and the golden pipes. I asked the church here in Hearst, I said, what's the most important thing in that illustration? It's not the pipes. It's the oil that the pipes deliver. That's what God wants us to, deli to deliver. The same thing that they delivered 2,000 years ago get the same result. Amen. <laughs> Thank you all, brethren, for coming. I appreciate this discussion tonight, these things that God's given different people. Who is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers that preached and you believe. Amen. I heard this, these words given to me back in the early 60s. They said, when you come here, you've got to see yourself. Then after a while, you've got to get to where you don't see yourself. That sounds like it's an unreasonable statement, doesn't it? But you've got to see who you are, where your faults are. What your job is. What is the job of the ministry today? <laughs> We're to deliver what Jesus is preaching today. Jesus is still preaching. People are reaching out. Things are changing. And I'm just glad I'm in here watching the change. I don't want to get locked down as an old man and not realize that things are going to move on beyond me. And younger men have a vision that God can use. They may need some guide, some leadership, but we're never to squash them. And what God's asked them to do, because this never will be restored if we don't allow it to grow and other men function, gifts, work. <clears throat> I'm seeing something great develop among us. We've got problems. We'll never get rid of all the problems. We never will. But we're to look beyond the problems and see what God's working on today, what God's building and keep asking this question, is Jesus talking or is he still silent? Did he ever become silent? I don't think he did. I think he's still preaching today, asking us, will we be true golden pipes, delivering golden oil to the lamps where saints of God can see what God's doing? All right. Thank you, brethren, for this today, tonight, I mean. We'll come back in the morning at Breakfast at 8.30 to 10, and the service starts at 10.30. If you need anything, please let the ushers know we're here to help. This is the host assembly. I told her, our folks, if it gets to be an overflow crowd, for them to move back in the dining room, make room for you, brethren. We still may have a few seats left up here, some of the brethren... Uh, wasn't able to make it. I don't think Brother Green may might not be here. Find out tonight. All right. All right. Could we all stand and just uh, give God a good thanks for all that he's done for us. Safe trip. Heavenly Father.